All right, guys, we're recording. Let me share my screen. Cool. So our first presentation and kind of the theme for this whole workshop is going to be kind of the stepping stones to getting you started on your job search. Um, so we're going to go every, over everything from elevator pitch, um, resume, LinkedIn, everything that you need to get started on your actual job search. Um, again, if you have any questions, I'll ask at the end of each slide. If anyone has questions, please feel free to ask then. I don't have my Slack open. I usually can't see your Zoom chat either, so just ask out loud. It's okay. Um, cool. We'll go ahead and get started. So the first thing I want to cover is professional summary and elevator pitch. Um, I think a lot of people get stuck on this. So your elevator pitch is essentially the tell me about yourself question. Um, you're going to get asked this in almost every interview that you do. Um, you're also going to need to talk a little bit about this on your LinkedIn. Some people can actually use this elevator pitch um, on their resume as well and your LinkedIn. Um, but essentially your elevator pitch is the tell me about yourself question. So what is an elevator pitch? Um, the way that you wanna structure your elevator pitch is essentially past, present, future. So you wanna try to keep it um, as structured as possible because I think sometimes people get stuck on this question and they're like, it's weird to talk about yourself. So if you get stuck, remember past, present, future. The past is essentially what your background is. Um, what were you doing before Lambda School? What were you doing before you decided you wanted to become a developer? It's important, even if it's not relevant at all to the technical world, even if you were flipping hamburgers, it's important for them to know what your background is. And it's a big deal. It's what you were doing before Lambda School. It was is what you were studying, maybe. It was what you were doing as a job before Lambda School, before becoming a developer. And it's only gonna help you in your experience as a whole. Um, so that would be the past portion. The present portion would be the why. So the why is why did you wanna become a developer? Um, this is a big deal because you want to make sure that you're explaining this is what I was doing in my past, this is why I wanted to become a developer. Not just I am a software developer, but why did you want to become a software developer? To change the world, to better my future, things like that. Um, hey, really quick, can everyone take a second and pause their Zoom? I'm hearing some background noise. I mean, not pause your Zoom, mute your Zoom. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so. How did you get into software development? This is where you wanna talk about Lambda School. I would say probably about 90% of the interviewers you talk to are gonna ask you about Lambda School because it is a little bit different. It's a different kind of program. Um, we will teach you how to explain Lambda School so I think that's kind of hard for people to explain sometimes, but this is where you'd wanna talk about Lambda School. You wanted to become a software developer, you found Lambda School, you went through this crazy program. It's crazy, it really is, um, but this is the present the why you became a software developer and how you found Lambda School. The future portion is very much, you can customize this to whoever you're talking to. So for instance, if you're talking to a company that's like in the financial district or financial industry, you would obviously cater your response to, I took my past, so whatever I was doing before Lambda School and the skills that I know now as a developer and I wanna use that in the financial world and you know, in the blockchain industry, whatever. So you're using whatever your past and present are and you're catering that to whoever you're talking to, um, that would be your future. But you can't forget about your future. You're trying to still explain to them like, I have this past, I have this now, these new skills as a developer, and this is what I wanna do with them. That would be your future portion. So again, if you ever get stuck on this question, because it is always kind of weird to talk about yourself, it's, it's just weird, um, past, present, future. Cool, so again, you're most likely gonna get this right off the bat, even in a technical interview. Um, it's kind of an icebreaker. So usually in a, in a behavioral interview, you're gonna get this like right off the bat. They're gonna say, hey, um, very nice to meet you. Tell me a little bit about yourself. When I do mock behavioral interviews, it's the first question I always ask, just so you guys know. And you're all gonna be doing mock behavioral interviews with us. So just keep that in mind. Um, but even in a technical interview, they have to break the ice somehow. They can't just be like, all right, let's get started. Like they're gonna ask you a little bit about yourself. And that's when, again, you give an elevator pitch. Um, 90 seconds maximum. So you're not trying to give them your whole life story. You're trying to keep it pretty short and sweet. Again, past, present, future, that's all you're really wanting to talk about. Um, and then keep it in that structure. So again, take this opportunity to humble brag. So humble brag is gonna, you're gonna hear me say that phrase like over and over again throughout my meetings with you guys. Anytime that you can kind of talk about any like technical skills that you have learned that you feel good about or even like soft skills, you wanna hype that up a little bit. 
Um, that's why it's important to also talk about your past because for instance, if you were like a manager at a store, you have leadership skills. So if you're trying to hype that up a little bit. It's only going to help you in whatever position you're trying to get. Um, and then especially on the technical interviews, you're still trying to talk a little bit about what you know, talk about those technical buzzwords, same thing in a behavioral interview. Most likely the person you're talking to in a behavioral interview is not going to be super technical, but they know the job description that you applied for and they know what kind of buzzwords they should be listening for. So again, you can say, you know, oh, I really want to talk about my present. Um, I really, I have enjoyed learning React and Python, all the things that you guys learn. Um, hype up your technical skills, hype up your, your leadership skills, your soft skills. This is a good way to do it inside your elevator pitch. And you can do it in a way where you're not just like, I'm so great at everything. The way you do that is by talking about past, present, future, and just kind of throwing in some of the things that you are good at. Um, so when we talk about elevator pitch on your LinkedIn and on your resume summary, it's a little bit different. So you're taking everything that you're saying for your elevator pitch, like something that you would say out loud in an interview and putting it on your LinkedIn um, or your resume. So for LinkedIn, you guys are going to be talk about LinkedIn a little bit later. LinkedIn can be as long as you want it to be. Um, if you did actually want to get into your whole life story on LinkedIn, you could do that because it'll condense it for you. And if people don't want to read it, they don't have to. Um, however, on your resume, if you're going to do a professional summary on your resume, you're still doing elevator pitch. So past, present, future, um, what you're doing in your background, why you want to become a developer, what you plan on doing with those skills. You're still talking about that in your resume, but your resume should only be about one page long, unless you have more years of experience, then you, it'll be a little bit longer, but either way, your summary shouldn't take up a lot of space. It should literally be about two to three sentences long. I've seen summaries that are even shorter than that. So again, your elevator pitch on your LinkedIn would be your LinkedIn summary. Um, it, it shows up right underneath all of your kind of your header, your profile picture, or on your resume summary, it will be somewhere near the top. But on your resume, it shouldn't be more than two to three sentences long. Cool. So I'm going to pause here for a second. Um, this is kind of my first round of slides. Does anybody have any questions on elevator pitch for just talking in an interview or LinkedIn or summary or resume summary? Remember, ask out loud because I can't see your questions. My only question is on your LinkedIn, are you putting um, Lambda School under education or are you putting that under work experience? Um, so we're about to get to LinkedIn, so I'll answer that question then, um, but it's, okay. it just depends. The answer to that is that it depends. Okay, because <laughs> some people worked as PMs, so I would take that as work experience and put like, you know, five months of work experience as a PM and then, I don't know, six months as a student. So that's why I was just wondering. Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's just going to depend on your individual experience and what your background has looked like as well and education and things like that. Um, but we're about to get to that. So I will answer that question in about five seconds. Um, anything specifically around elevator pitch, putting it on your LinkedIn or your resume summary. Um, when you talk about Lambda school, do you, do you, would it be wise to say that it's a boot camp, or what, how would you phrase okay. Lambda? Um, so I have a little blurb that I share with everyone about how you describe Lambda school. Never under any circumstance, situation, anything, are we referring to Lambda School as a boot camp? So I'm coming out of the technical recruiting world. In even back then, when I was in it, um, boot camps were seen as kind of a, a negative thing. They had a negative connotation. We are trying to get as far away from being called a boot camp as possible because Lambda School is so 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 much more than a boot camp. You guys, I worked for a boot camp, so I worked for a boot camp a whole year before I came to Lambda School as a as a director of career readiness. The boot camps in the technical industry are usually really short. They don't really teach you real life skills. They kind of teach you how to do some projects and like really superficial stuff. Lambda school is so much more than that. So we are really trying not to refer to it as a boot camp at all. If you're, if someone's like, well, what is it? You can say it's a program. Um, it's a computer science program. That's, that's kind of how like short term, that's how you would say it. Um, but I have a whole blurb for you guys that you can literally repeat word for word when people ask you about Lambda school and you can put that on your resume. You should put that on your resume under education, or you can say it's someone. And we'll get to that in just a little bit, but when you're talking about Lambda School, you never want to refer to it as a boot camp. Um, so kind of just main thing there. But they will ask you about it because in other people's eyes, like Lambda School, because it was such a long period of time, um, it's, it's a little bit different because they're like, well, it's not a boot camp. They're looking at it like they were there for a long time. So what is this like Lambda School? What is this? 
you can always refer to it as a program, computer science program, or like higher education. That's what I always tell people. Because to me, Lambda School is very much structured like higher education. Um, because you're basically working through from the baseline all the way to actually creating things hands-on. So to me, it's higher education, um, or you can just say it's a computer science program. But I actually have like a little blurb for you guys that I'll share in a little bit. Can you say it's a immersive program where you get a bunch of soft skills and you develop real world projects and then you build up your skill set enough to be employable by XYZ company, you know, 100%, 100%. So obviously you can kind of customize what I'll share with you guys in just a little bit. You can customize that to however you want to say it, just avoid calling it a boot camp. And actually the word immersive is literally in my little blurb that I have for um, Lambda school. So you can definitely say it's immersive because it is. Um, you also at some point want to mention that it was like a full-time program. You're working 40 plus hours a week, essentially like you're working full-time and coding. You're coding full-time, you're learning full-time, you're hands-on creating projects full-time. Um, so really that's kind of what you want to harp on. Full-time, program, higher education, all the things that Lambda School is. But whatever you call it, don't call it a boot camp. Um, so we'll get to that in a little bit. I'll kind of show you, share with, my, with you guys my little blurb that I have. Um, again, you can customize that however you want to, make it your own. Um, but it's a good little blurb to kind of just have in mind when people ask you about Lambda School, because they will, especially in the interviews. Um, cool. Any more questions on elevator pitch? No, just another response. Um, so when you say higher education, what if they say, but it's not accredited? You can say it's not accredited, but it's still higher education. I learned okay. I started here and now I'm here. So that to me is considered higher education. Um, and they usually won't kind of, they won't push back on you on that. You guys, they usually just want to know like, what is like, they just want to know that you're, it wasn't a boot camp. Like as sad as that is, there definitely is a stigma around boot camps, And there's a reason behind that because a lot of people graduating from these really short term boot camps don't necessarily have the skills they need to be working on a, a development team. Um, Lambda school is not like that. Like we're, we are, you're learning the skills, all the skills that you need, not just technical skills, but soft skills, fundamentals, everything that you'll need to know to work on an actual development team. So that's the difference. And, and really like, they're not going to push back. They literally just want to know what it is. Um, so really shouldn't be too crazy to explain to them what Lambda school is. And again, I have a little blurb for you guys. You can learn it word for word. You can make it your own, but it's going to be, you'll see in a second what I'm talking about. Cool. All right, we're gonna move past elevator pitch to LinkedIn. Awesome. So hacking LinkedIn. So I know probably half of you have not even used LinkedIn, or if you did, you created one a long time ago, you haven't touched it since then, or you hate LinkedIn. So I've got, I've got my categories of people with LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. To me, I've had LinkedIn since as long as I've been working, so a long time and I have over 5,000 connections because I love LinkedIn. It is a hundred percent has been, I've been utilized it as business development. I utilized it to get myself jobs, to get other people jobs. I love LinkedIn so much. And there's just certain things that people, I think they don't realize about LinkedIn. They take advantage of it and they don't use it the way it's supposed to be used. You guys should be using LinkedIn to get noticed. So your LinkedIn is going to hundred percent help you get your profile out there, get exposure from recruiters. That's what you're using LinkedIn for, to get noticed. Couple of, of things about LinkedIn. So, your headshot. Your headshot does not have to be a professional picture by any means. I know some people just don't have professional pictures, that's okay. What you're looking for in a headshot is that you, it's an appropriate headshot, so obviously this guy with the margarita at the bottom, probably not a good idea. So make sure it's appropriate. Um, even if your dog is the cutest dog in the world, you can't have a headshot with other people or other objects in it. It should just be you, you looking into the camera. Recruiters use LinkedIn mostly to make sure that you don't have like a Mike Tyson tattoo on your face. Like as sad as that sounds, and they shouldn't do that because they shouldn't be judging what you look like or anything. Most of the time recruiters just want to make sure that, you know, you don't have crazy tattoos on your face or anything crazy like that. They just want to make sure that you're an actual human being because sometimes they get trolled by like these resumes that aren't actually people's resumes. So they want to make sure you're an actual person and your headshot is how they do that. Um, so make sure it's just you in the picture. Um, no duck face. Please don't do duck face in your, in your LinkedIn profile. It should be a professional looking picture. Um, even if it's not an actual professional profile picture, it's okay. As long as you're looking directly into the camera um, and it's just you. So again, 
so you can tell this, this one's not a professional picture. Nobody actually like paid somebody to take this picture, but it's still a good profile picture. He's looking right into the camera. You can tell who it is. Um, obviously he cropped somebody out a little bit, which I probably would have done a better job of making sure you can tell that it's not cropped. Um, but it's just him by himself. And then obviously like the other two, they're looking directly into the camera. Um, you know, nice smile. You don't want to look like a mugshot either. So make sure you smile in your picture. So that's really what they're looking for. So just looking right into the camera, making sure you're not making any crazy faces. It's just you, um, things like that. And we are going to be checking out all of your LinkedIn. So we'll help you with this if we need to, but just so you know, these are kind of the things to look for. Um, so summary and headline. Uh, so you guys, a lot of you, when you're creating your LinkedIn, you're going to see that anytime you change anything in your experience section, it's going to move it to your headline. So if your last experience was store manager at PetSmart, that's what your headline is going to be. You can actually go in and manually change this. Everyone's headline, sh nobody's headline should read student. Nobody's headline should read searching for an opportunity or anything like that. Anything along those lines. Um, or currently seeking an opportunity. Your headline is what is your future job, what you want your future job to be. So for some of you, that'll be like front end developer. For some of you, it'll be back end developer, full stack developer, whatever, full stack engineer. However you want your title to be when you graduate and get a job, that's what your headline's gonna be. You're trying to put your future title basically in headline. Um, and then again, for summary, we just talked about this. So elevator pitch in your LinkedIn summary is that's what it should be. And the di difference between LinkedIn and resume is that on your resume, you have to keep it fairly short. You don't want to take up a lot of space. Your summary on your LinkedIn can be seven paragraphs long. It can be your whole life story. You're still trying to encompass past, present, future, but it can be your whole life story because it will just condense it down for you. Um, and if people don't want to read it, they don't have to. If they want to read it, they can see, see more and they'll, they can read your whole thing. So your LinkedIn summary can be as long as you want it to be. But again, make sure it's still past, present, future. And then your headline, you want to manually change that, um, which will help you guys do, to whatever you want your future job title to be. As long as it's not like CEO or something crazy like that. Like, obviously, be realistic. You want it to be something along the lines of developer or engineer. But if you're leaning more towards front end, it would be front end engineer, obviously towards back end, back end engineer, et cetera. I have a question. Yes. A lot of people I've seen use really formal, uh, formal language, like unnatural language. What do you think of that? Um, like a natural language as far as like writing out their summary or what do you mean? By yeah, that? And their summary. Um, like it, it, it's just like very proper, but it, it, to me it doesn't feel very friendly or open or natural. Yeah, so here's another thing about LinkedIn, you guys. LinkedIn is one of the platforms that you can actually show off your personality a little bit. So I would advise just being yourself, just writing out again, whatever you want your past, present, future to be, that's your summary for LinkedIn. And it doesn't have to be like super prop or anything like that. Obviously you want to be, still be a little bit professional. You don't want to use like swear words or anything crazy like that, but you're still wanting it to show off a little bit of your personality, a little bit of your quirk. Everyone's different. And that's what you're trying to show off. Be different. Um, so yeah, if you, if you have very proper language, if you're an English major, such as myself, I would probably use really proper language because that's just how I write. But if you're not like that, you don't have to like go and like look up words in the dictionary and try to sound really proper. You don't have to do that at all. Um, again, make sure your people are still seeing this though. Your future employers are potentially seeing what you're writing. Everything on the internet is seen by everyone. So be professional, be, um, you know, don't say swear words or anything crazy, but be yourself. That's what LinkedIn is for. Your resume is to show off your skills. Your LinkedIn is, is to show off your personality. So show some personality a little bit. Be a little bit quirky. It's okay. People want to see that. Did I answer that question? Yes, thank you. Cool. So here's some examples of just some good profile, like kind of the header portion. Um, LinkedIn doesn't really look like this anymore. These are kind of some older looking profiles, but they're very similar. The first thing I did want to mention, so Laura has a background picture. In all of your LinkedIn, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and assume that probably 80% of you don't have a background picture currently. It's just a little blue rectangle. You definitely want to add a background picture because if a recruiter is looking at your LinkedIn and they know and they see that you don't have a background picture, they're going to assume that you're never on LinkedIn and they will not connect with you on LinkedIn or contact you on LinkedIn um, because it gets frustrating when you're trying to contact somebody who's never on LinkedIn, obviously. But that's why you want to add a background picture. Your background picture can literally be anything you want it to be as long as it's appropriate. It can be a picture of your family. It can be a picture of lines of code, 
A lot of people use like cityscapes, landscapes, things like that, but it can be anything you want it to be. Again, this is another way to show off your personality, show off your quirk a little bit. Um, just make sure it's appropriate. Again, Courtney and myself are going to be looking at your LinkedIn, so we, we can help direct you if we need to, but for the most part, it can be pretty much whatever you want it to be. Um, just make sure you change it from that little, the formal, the like normal little LinkedIn blue rectangle. You don't want to leave it like that because it's going to, people are going to assume you're never on LinkedIn. Um, even if you aren't, you want people to assume that. So a um, couple things about just this portion. So obviously it's a good profile picture. Um, she's looking directly in the camera. There's, you know, she doesn't like evidently crop people out or anything like that. Um, software engineer. So that's her headline. That's what her title is. Um, and then it'll usually show like your last experience or something like that. Right now it looks a little bit different on LinkedIn. So it'll just show basically Laura Reynolds and software engineer. Everything else will be off to the side. Um, but so you just want to make sure you're doing a good headline. So you don't want to put anything like coding ninja or things like that. Your headline is the only place really on LinkedIn that you want to be semi professional, a little bit more serious because you're essentially putting what you want your future title to be. Your future title is not going to be coding ninja for the most part. So make sure you're putting full stack engineer, full stack developer, however you want to say it, that's what your headline is going to be. And you have to manually change that. Otherwise it's just going to keep pulling from your experience. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later, but the important thing is that she has a good background picture, good profile picture, good headline. Um, and again, so her, her summary is still talking about past, present, future. She talks about her background. She talks about what she's doing presently, what she wants to do. Um, but she also throws a little bit of quirk in here, which is what we kind of just talked about. It's okay to be a little less formal in your LinkedIn summary in your LinkedIn in general. Um, you're still trying to show off, you know, your personality, this person, whoever's looking at your resume and your LinkedIn, they've already seen what you can do as far as skill set. So now your LinkedIn is okay. Well, this person fit in with the team. So again, you're starting to show off your personality a little bit. She talks about how she enjoys drinking coffee and building ceramics. Um, give a little bit of personal, you know, background, give a little bit of work. Um, so same thing. So I like this one because I like to show people that you don't have to have a professional picture. Obviously this one's not professionally done, but it's still a good picture. I can tell what she looks like. I can tell she doesn't have you know, giant tattoos all over her face or whatever the case may be. She's got a good background picture. Um, so, I wanted to mention, this is what I was talking about. Oops. This is what I was talking about with um, the headline because she's currently an employee channel, which this one's okay. Cause it's also a software engineer, but it just pulled, she didn't manually go in and change this. It just pulled from her last experience, which it, it will do for all of you if you don't manually change it. Um, so if this, for instance, if she was like a janitor and employee channel, it would show up janitor at employee channels or headline, unless she changed it to software engineer. So just make sure you're making that headline what you want it to be. Um, you can manually do that. Um, but again, her, her summary is pretty good. So she talks about background, what she's doing now, um, what she's interested in, her future. And then she actually puts here her like GitHub, things like that, her, the link to her portfolio, it looks like, and her contact information. Um, you can do that in your summary. So there's not like a good place on LinkedIn for you to put your GitHub information. So you can actually put your GitHub link or like a portfolio link to your, into your summary. Um, the other place to do your portfolio link would also be in your project section, which we'll get to that in a second. Um, but there's really not a good place to put GitHub. So a lot of people put their GitHub link in their actual summary and you can do that as well if you want to. Um, so again, another good background picture, um, good profile picture. So he actually looks like he went in and manually changed this. He, he wanted people to know he's a senior software engineer at PlayStation. That's his headline. Um, and you can keep it like that if you want to. But so this is what I'm talking about. He has actually a, a long summary. And in the case that your summary is really long, it'll condense it for you in LinkedIn. So people aren't like scrolling through pages and pages on your LinkedIn. So don't worry about it being too long. Um, or it can be like three words. It's really up to you guys. Your summary is completely up to you. It's very customizable. Um, but again, past, present, future elevator pitch. Um, but again, he has a good background picture and he has wood. Like, I don't, it's like a fence. It can be whatever you want it to be. As long as you have a background picture, that's all I'm saying. So experience, um, I get this question quite a bit from a lot of my grads and students. So everyone usually asks me like, how do I, a lot of these job descriptions are asking for a certain amount of experience. And like, I don't have that. Like, well, how do I do this? How do I get around this? So little insider tip couple different things actually for those job descriptions even if they're asking for five years of experience 
A, they mean five years of total experience. So even if you've never had an actual software engineering job, but you've worked for five years in another industry, that counts as experience. So use your background experience, that counts. They just wanna know that you've worked in a professional setting. So even if it says like five years experience, they mean like, okay, well you've had 10 years of prior experience, that still counts, so keep applying to that job. The other thing is you should be applying to any job that is five years of experience and less in the technical world, as long as it doesn't specifically say like senior or mid-level engineer. Um, because a lot of recruiters and a lot of people who are writing these job descriptions are just trying to get the best, the biggest bang for their buck. So they'll put all these like years of experience. They don't necessarily need that. If you have over 50% of the skills that they're looking for and you know that you can do this job, apply to it. Unless it specifically says like senior level or architect level or whatever, um, apply to it. And we'll get into that later next week when we talk about the job search and things like that. But just so you guys know, Usually when they're talking about years of experience in a job description, they're talking about your whole experience as a whole. Um, so keep that in mind. This is why we wanna keep things on our resume and our LinkedIn, even if it's not relevant to the tech world. Um, so experience, so full stack developer. I wanna highlight something real quick before we move past. So you guys are asking me how you talk about Lambda School. This is the best description that I have seen from a student talking about Lambda School. And I actually told him, I'm like, hey, I'm jacking this and I'm sharing it with everyone because this is a great description of what Lambda School is. Um, so you'll see like quite a few people have the same exact description for Lambda School and it's okay if you use it because it's a really good one. So if someone asks you what Lambda School is, great response. Computer Science and Software Engineering Academy provides immersive hands-on curriculum focused on computer science, software engineering, and web development. That is a great response because that is what Lambda School is. The only thing that I would add to that is to make sure that you tell them that it's school time. It was six plus months, seven months, full-time, 40 hours a day, I mean 40 hours a day, 40 hours a week coding, probably more than that, honestly, maybe 40 hours a day, <laughs> you never know. Um, but this is a great description of Lambda School. A lot of you are gonna be using this, um, but you can use this in an interview. If someone asks you about what Lambda School is, you can use this on your resume, you can use this on your LinkedIn. Um, but this description right here is a great description of what Lambda School is. Another thing I wanted to mention, so notice how this grad does not have student here. Anytime you have like student or currently seeking or anything along those lines anywhere on your resume or in your LinkedIn, it's a red flag for recruiters. Do not put student, you're no longer gonna be a student, especially once you graduate. First of all, you just spent like six months learning all of these things and hands-on creating something. You're not a student anymore, you're, you're a developer. You hands-on created this project that you guys are gonna be working on, you're a developer now. Um, you also don't want to imply that you're very green because you're not like you, you spent all this time learning. It was basically a full-time job. You're not green. Um, so you never want to say anything like student or anything like that in here. Um, some of you will actually have full stack developer and then others will have, if you're TAs, you'll have teaching assistant or class lead or whatever the case may be. So just make sure you don't have student as your title for Lambda school ever. So not even in, if you put it in education, not if you put it in experience and not on your resume either. Um, and again, this goes back to saying, uh, especially for your headline, never want to say like currently seeking or, you know, whatever the case may be. That's a red flag. Recruiters want what they can't have. They want to know that you're working. So I would tell everyone to keep Lambda School present because you can keep that present as long as you want to. But for the meantime, while you're doing your job search, insider tip, you always want to have present so that they assume that you're still there because they'll, that's more than of an incentive to call you. It's really weird how that works. They don't want people who are not working. It's weird. But trust me. Um, Anyways, so great description for Lambda School. The overview, this is gonna be a little bit different for everyone. So literally I told this student for, this is a good description for your overview, what you wanna put for the meat of what Lambda School is, make this very much your own. So this, I told him, remember things that you really like to do, remember things that were hard for you to do but you've completed them and you're proud of it. Those are the kind of things that you should be putting in your LinkedIn and in your resume because Anything that you put in your resume or your LinkedIn is fair game for an interviewer to ask you about. So if you're going through Python and you're like, man, I, I hate Python and I really don't ever want to do this again, don't put Python in your job description. Even though you did it, even though you worked on that at Lambda, don't put it in there because then they're going to ask you about it and you're going to have to say like, well, not that great at it or I hate it actually. So for this portion, this overview portion, really try to focus on things that you feel strongly about, things that you really enjoy doing that you're good at, that you just remember doing, and you're like, this was really fun, I really wanna do this in my future job. Those are the things you should be putting in your overview. Um, he's got a huge list, you don't have to have a big list like that, 
um, it can be like three or four bullets. On LinkedIn, it can be as long as you want it to be. So he has quite a long one, and then on his resume, it's a little bit shorter than this. He kind of condensed it a little bit. But um, LinkedIn can be as long as you want. And then just make sure you're always listing your curriculum as well. You want to do this because, so just like they're going to do on your resume, they're going to do this on your LinkedIn, a keyword search. So anytime that it can pop up like some of these buzzwords, these tech buzzwords that they're looking for, you want it to show up on your LinkedIn. So I always tell people to have kind of a little section where they just list off some of the tech stack that they learned here. Again, keep in mind that anything that's on here, they can ask you about. So if you hated Python, don't put Python in here. But some of the things that you felt really strongly about that if someone asks you about it, you're going to be able to answer them. I have a question. Yes. Um, you talked about not uh, saying that you're green, for example, um, or not show, showing red flags. I mean, I am 46, and I feel like some people may look at that and think, well, he's not going to be willing to take a job as a junior developer. Uh, and, and so I, I, I feel like I should describe myself as a junior that is willing to learn, but I don't know if that's right. Yeah. What do old people do? I'm also old. <laughs> Y'all aren't old. Um, okay. So here's the first thing when you're applying to these jobs, you're applying to them. They're not going to see your resume or your LinkedIn unless you apply. If you're applying to junior software engineer roles, they're assuming that you want to be a junior software engineer right off the bat. You're applying to that actual title. Um, that being said, you probably will get a couple questions, especially if you have prior experience and you have like over 10 years of experience, whatever the case may be. They'll probably say like, well, like well, you were doing this before, like, you know, this is going to be a junior role. They'll probably just ask you about it. Here's the thing. If you have the skills, I'm going to tell you guys an insight, another insider secret. As a technical recruiter, their main goal is to find these resumes that have all the buzzwords on them. They give your resume maybe like a five second look over. If you have all the skills they need, they're like, okay, cool. They have those skills that I'm looking for, or like at least 75% of those skills, whatever the case may be. They have this and this and this, move them on to the next round. At that point, the interviewer, whoever you're talking to, even if it's a recruiter, whoever you're talking to, that's when they dive into your background. So that first round of interviews is going to be like, okay, well, I see that you have this amount of years of experience. Then you went through this program. They can see that you've done a shift, obviously. Like they can see that you went from whatever this was beforehand to now being a developer. Like they're going to know that, okay, you haven't had much experience in this, even though you have all these prior years of experience, obviously you're, you know, fairly new at this. You're still looking kind of for your first job here. They'll know that ahead of time. And if they, if they have questions about it, they'll ask you. And at that point you say, you know, I have prior years of experience in different industries. I'm, I'm new to the technical, technical world or the development world. I'm really just looking to learn and, and pick up as many skills as I can, work hard for the company, et cetera. Like there's so many different ways you can answer that question. Um, but don't worry about it showing like that on your resume. Because the other thing too is you still want to talk about your background experience. It's, it's only relevant. Like even if it has nothing to do with technology or development, like you're still showing that you've worked in a professional setting, that you've worked on a team before most likely. Um, that you have some professional background. That's what you're trying to show off. And a lot of those skills will be able to help you in your development world, like leadership skills, communication skills. Those are only going to help in the tech world. It's actually, I would say that it's a plus to have that because a lot of straight developers who are coming out of school don't really have soft skills. Like that's what they're having to teach these developers. And that's way harder to teach than technical skills. So they appreciate that you have those soft skills in your background. They're not going to question you like, hey, you've been doing this for a while. Like, I don't think you're going to take a junior job. You already applied to it. You're applying to those jobs. They see that. So if they have questions, they'll ask you about it. And at that point, you just tell them, hey, like I'm, you know, I have this prior experience, but I'm starting kind of fresh with this. I want to continue to learn. I want to kind of move up along the way. So I am definitely willing to take a, a junior job. Okay. Is it, I guess, uh, is it wrong to say that I'm a, I mean, is it not what you would recommend if they say, do you consider yourself a junior, mid-level or senior? So the there's a workaround for that question. I would never flat out answer that question. I'm going to be really honest with you because you never want to put yourself in a situation where you're labeling yourself. You want them to tell you. So in that situation, I would say, honestly, like I have these skills. I believe that I would be a really good contribution to the team. Um, I really love this company. 
at this point, I would start wherever you guys would like me to start. That's what you say. Unless, unless you applied to a position that was specifically like mid-level or it was just a software engineer, don't let them undercut you either. So if you applied to a position, it was a software engineer, not junior, nothing like that. You get through all the rounds. You're like, you know, like, I don't know about bringing you on as a software engineer. Like, this is how you work around that question. Like, you don't want to be a junior engineer if you didn't apply for a junior engineer position. You would say, give me, you can do a 90-day performance review. And at that point, if you think that I am still junior level, then we can negotiate talking about that. And I will go down and work with the junior level team. But you never want to give yourself a label. When we talk about resumes in a second, you guys will also hear me say, you never want to rank your skills on your resume or anywhere. You never want to rank your title or anything like that. You want to let them tell you what they think you are and where you are. For a lot of you, you're going to actually have technical assessments where they're, they can figure out like where you are technically. Um, and at that point, they'll say, hey, I, we think you're better for this team or this team, whatever. Um, and then it's up to you if you want to continue with the process and they have you down maybe like at a junior engineer level, it's up to you. If you want to continue with the process, you continue with it. If you don't, then you don't. But you never want to be the first one to say like, yeah, I'm a junior engineer or like I, I prefer junior level. To me, you guys, I think I think I get frustrated because I, I know that you guys have imposter syndrome right now. A lot of you have imposter syndrome. You're like, I don't know, like I'm not ready yet. You're 100% ready especially after capstone defense doing that project going through the panel like that's hard what you guys have done to this point is so difficult like that's crazy what you guys have done i'm like i'm very impressed by all of you but i have had students come out of boot camps that get software engineer mid-level engineer positions if they can come out with those type of roles you guys a hundred percent can come out not as junior engineers but just software engineers some of you mid-level some of you senior level like it's not about it's not about years of experience, honestly, you guys, like, especially in the technical world, it sucks because sometimes you have to get through that gatekeeper of having like a certain amount of years of experience. But at the end of the day, they're measuring your technical skills. A lot of you are way surpassing, like even just like mid-level. So don't worry about it for now. If you start to see that like things are, you're applying for these jobs, you're not getting them or whatever the case may be, then we work on it together. We'll help you. The technical staff will help you. However, for now, just know that you never want to rate yourself. Like you never want to say, I'm, I'm a junior engineer. I prefer junior engineer. Like let them rate you <laughs> because you're only going to, A, if they bring you up to a mid-level status, like you're going to make more money and potentially in your next job, you'll be a senior engineer, make even more money. And at the skill level you guys are at, like, I don't think that you guys are at a junior level. I really don't. I think you're coming out with more knowledge and experience than you actually think you are compared to a lot of people. Sabrina, we haven't had a, uh... Lambda Labs yet, or the defense that's coming up after we do Python and Django. Yeah. So I, I was just I didn't know if you knew that. That's um, I've got some I've got some grads on the team, or I've got some lab alone oh, okay, okay. as well. But it it still applies. You guys are going to go through labs and be like, okay, yeah, I know, I, yep. I know a lot more than I did before I did labs. Trust me. And the thing is, like as developers, you're always learning, so don't ever feel like you're going to know everything. You you won't. So that's, I think much. that's where <laughs> imposter syndrome comes in. Cause you're like, well, I don't know everything. Or like, I don't know all these things that are on this job description. That's okay. If you know half of them apply. Okay. Another question. Okay. Yes. What if you're applying for remote jobs? Do you first, A, do you think that we should re apply for remote jobs or should we apply for professional settings where you have to actually be there and learn from other engineers as a team first? Um, so normally if, so back in the day when I worked with my boot camp grads, they were not at the level that you guys were at. A hundred percent, I was like, I think that it'd be better if you worked in a professional setting so that you have like somewhere to bounce ideas off of. And like, <laughs> for a lot of you, you don't necessarily need that. And especially because like, listen, Lambda's remote. And for the most part, like you guys know how to work on a remote team. That's a lot of our boot camp students, they're on site and they don't know, they do not have the organizational skills, the time management skills to work remotely. You guys already have that which you've proven now because you've gone through the program. So for most, for most of you, you can work remotely and it's definitely okay to apply to remote roles. It's, it's completely up to your preference. If you prefer remote roles, a hundred percent go for it. Some people prefer to, they still want to be on site. They still want to interact with people, have someone to bounce ideas off of things like that. So you work on site. Um, but for, feel free to apply to remote roles. I think it's not going to do you any harm. You already know how to work remotely. So what's the best place to look for remote jobs? 
Um, we work remotely. Um, that's my favorite website, but there's a thousand of them out where we, we work remotely is my favorite one. They have the best, like most, I guess, updated jobs, I would say. But there's like a thousand, y'all, there's a thousand different remote job boards for developers specifically. So, um, cool. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, Our next I have one question, I can, about resumes. Do you think that if we apply for, for example, front-end uh, developer, uh, do we also need to put official formal resumes or we can make it a bit artsy with some styles, CSS, some, some crazy stuff? Um, so are you saying like as far as like your resume, how your resume style should look? Yeah, instead of just uh, blocks of text, maybe some art or uh, colors. You know. Hold hold on that question. We're gonna get to resume in just a second, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Okay, let's hold on that one. Is there are is there any questions about what we just talked about? Uh, one last one last question. Uh, yes. Do you think that we should apply for jobs that uh, state that you need to have at least two years of, of uh, commercial experience for yes. junior? <sighs> developer listen y'all rule of thumb and I'll, we're, we're going to talk a lot about a lot more about this next week um it's like all of our job search stuff is next week but rule of thumb anything that's five years and less even six years hell six years or less and it doesn't specifically say senior level mid-level apply trust me they're just they're casting a wide net to see who they pull in but if you have the the skill sets that they're looking for and you're like i could do this job apply cool all right, guys, I'm going to move on because otherwise we're going to be, I really am going to make this a two-hour presentation. Okay. Oh, so I just wanted to go back to this. And this definitely goes back to, like, talking about years of experience. So, again, <coughs> a store manager. Okay, everyone mute themselves really quickly, please, again. Um, store manager of Verizon. Not technical role. Not really at all. You still want to talk about this. It was four years of time. You don't want to just have chunks of time where you don't talk about what you did in your background because that's a super red flag. Any huge time gaps like that, Will be a red flag so again talk about your background talk about what you've done um but through talking about that and in your description especially for if they're non-relevant like tech roles you only want to have a couple of bullets pretty much most of the time on your resume on your linkedin you can have as many bullets as you want um i always tell people like basically your your resume and your linkedin mirror each other but the things that you have to take out of your resume you can put on linkedin so for instance like if this was this whole job description was on someone's resume, I would tell them to only use the first two lines, literally. Um, anything that has a numerical value will catch a recruiter's eye. Anything that's an accomplishment will also catch a recruiter's eye. So really you're trying to focus on accomplishments, anything with a numerical value, even if it's not relevant to development at all. Um, but you still want to talk about your background, always. Um, so what if you came from a different, different job or different uh, career, right? And then you took a couple of years off because you were self-teaching yourself. Then you got into Lambda school and then in Lambda school, you were there for another year. <laughs> so the way that you would do that is instead of using, um, and again, we're about to talk about resumes, but I'll just, instead of doing that, you would say, so whatever you finish your last position, you would have that as your last date. So if you finish your last role in like 2012, from 2012 to 2014, you only did like self-taught stuff, put down the, the things that you used, Coursera, Udacity, anything that you used, and that would fill in the space for two years. From 2012 to 2014, you did this and this and this, self-taught, and you have one line. But you always need to explain your time gaps, because otherwise, if you just leave it off and it goes from 2012 to 2014, they're going to be like, what were you doing for two years? And it's, it's frowned upon. So you just want to explain before you even go into the situation. We're having to like then tell, talk about it a lot or like get into an awkward situation. So just make sure, and again, we're going to be – at the end of this, you guys are going to be signing up to do resume one-on-ones with your career coach. We will walk you through exactly what you, you should be putting on, taking off your resume, leaving on your resume, things like that. Cool. cool. Well, the reason, yeah, the reason I joined Lambda is because I self-taught myself as much as I can, right, up to like intermediate algorithms, and it got really hard. So I figured an immersive program would be the best way to go from there, and that's when I joined Lambda. You and probably about like 80% of the students are probably in the same boat. So That's don't right. worry, we'll, we'll have you, we'll help you figure that out on your resume. As long as there's no gaps is really what you're trying to avoid big time gaps, but we'll help you fill everything in so that it, they can tell like this is the progress you made and this is the route you took. Like we'll make sure that it, it shows that on your resume. So um, cool. So moving a little bit on from there and we'll get to resumes in a second, you guys, like that's kind of my biggest slide and we'll talk a little bit more in depth about it. But 
for LinkedIn specifically, there's a couple things that I really want you guys to add on LinkedIn and people just don't even know that these are sections that you can add. So accomplishments, it's really weird that they have projects under accomplishments, but 100% add your projects onto your LinkedIn and you do that by going to the accomplishments tab and just adding projects. There's a little drop down menu, you add projects. Every project that you've ever done, I want on LinkedIn. Because again, LinkedIn can be the place where you just accumulate all your things, all your experience, all your projects, all your everything. Um, because it can be as long as you want it to be. You want to make sure you mention even small projects that you've done. If you really enjoyed doing one project, put it on there. Even if it's not done, even if it's not beautiful, you want people to see that you've got a running portfolio of projects on your LinkedIn. For most of you, you're going to have a portfolio site. You're going to have something along those lines, but some of you won't have that. And even if you do have that, sometimes people like recruiters are lazy. They don't want to go look at your portfolio. So they'll look at your LinkedIn be like, Oh, cool. They have like six projects. Cool. I'll call them. So, Again, it's under accomplishments. That's something that I 100% everyone should add onto their LinkedIn. It's under accomplishments. You just pull down the drop down menu, you add your projects. Um, the other thing so, accomplishments, education, volunteer work, and interests. Again, LinkedIn is the place where you can add all the things that you may not necessarily be able to fit on your resume. A lot of you have volunteer work, a lot of you guys have interests, um, education, even if it's not relevant to technology, put it in LinkedIn. Um, I will say, Rule of thumb about education, I know a lot of you are gonna ask me about this. Even if you went to school for eight years and you don't have a degree, don't put it on your resume or your LinkedIn. I know it sucks and I know you worked hard, but if you do not have a degree, don't, put your, don't list education because if they ask you about it, you're gonna to have to like go into this awkward conversation about how you went there eight years and then you didn't graduate. So only if you have a degree, even if it's an associate's degree, associate's degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, all the way up from there. Put it on LinkedIn, even if it's not relevant to technology at all. Um, but that's the only situation where you're using it, that under education. The other thing you can put under education is if you got a certificate. Actually, I think there's actually a separate portion for certificates. If you have any type of like vocational certificate, put it in there. Talk about your background. Anything that you've ever acquired or accomplished, you want to put, put it in LinkedIn. So again, education, you, if you've done volunteer work, put your volunteer work in there. It's good for people to know that you volunteer, like that's a good thing. Um, featured skills and endorsements. So this portion actually looks a little bit different. Um, LinkedIn did a big update and it looks a little bit differently than it does now. For featured skills and endorsements, you can actually go in now and pin your top three skills. So no matter how many skills you add, I want you guys to pin your top three technical skills. So whatever, and that's gonna be different for everyone probably. So you actually go in, you, and it'll pull up like a whole list of your skills and you click on a little blue pin and you pin your top three. Um, it's okay if you pin certain things because even if a recruiter is doing a keyword search, all of your skills will still pop up. So even if it's like, if you have Python in this skill list and it's just not pinned, it'll still pop up if they do a Python keyword search. But if you want to pin your top three skills in case your recruiter's being lazy and they don't feel like doing a keyword search, they're just scrolling through, they can see your top three skills right off the bat. So hundred percent top three technical skills, you guys. That's important, not soft skills, just technical. Um, and then for interests, so I think people will take advantage of this little section. Interests, you are going to wanna follow every single company that you apply to. So think of LinkedIn as kind of Twitter in that way. If you wanna apply at Google, go follow Google. You want that company, whoever's looking at your LinkedIn profile to see that you're following them, that you're interested in them. Um, it doesn't just have to be companies, you can follow groups, you can follow people. Obviously, influential people in the tech world, not, not bad people to follow. Um, but you want to follow these companies because A, they can see that you follow them under your interest tab. B, you'll get alerts on if they open new jobs or if they post an article, anything like that. So make sure you're following relevant people, relevant companies in the tech world. Anyone that you, anywhere that you apply, make sure you follow on LinkedIn. Um, okay, so recommendations tab. Um, so recommendations are not a make or break. You do not have to have recommendations. It's always good to have them. Recommendations are really easy though, because you're not actually doing anything. You're literally asking to be recommended. You don't have to type anything. You don't have to do anything. You, there's a little button that says ask, ask to be recommended. Just ask somebody. You can ask myself. You can ask your instructors. This is kind of another way to humble brag about yourself. Again, my favorite term of life. Um, this is just a kind of a way to brag about yourself. You are trying to ask for recommendations from people who you know are going to be like, yeah, they were great. Um, obviously, if you don't have a good relationship with that person, probably don't ask them for a recommendation. 
Um, but again, this is not make or break. If you have the time to do it, go for it. Um, I always think it's a good sign if you can get a recommendation. Join alumni group. You guys, Lambda School is massively growing a lot, even since I first started. So make sure you're following everyone at Lambda School, especially your career coach um, or both career coaches. Make sure you're following everyone you can at Lambda School. It's only going to help you. We have a massive network of our instructors know everyone from the tech world. They can get you referrals. Your fellow alumni can get you referrals. Make sure you're following everyone on at Lambda School. Um, also, you don't want to have like three connections because that's very frowned upon on LinkedIn. Try to get as many connections as you can with people that are in your alumni network. Um, goal for LinkedIn for today, a little bit of homework, try to get at least 50 connections by the end of the week. So connect with people that are in your alumni network that maybe you went to school with you, um, people that are in the technical world. Um, don't just connect with everyone, you guys, especially when you start making updates to LinkedIn and everything like that, you're gonna start getting some spam. That's just the way it works. Don't connect with any outsourced third-party recruiters that you don't know or that look sketchy at all. Um, Cause you will get like a lot of connection notices for like people that you're like, I don't even know who that is. So be careful about, uh, you know, connecting with everyone, but a good way to add connections is connect with everyone at Lambda, connect with your career coach, instructional staff, Austin, connect with everyone at Lambda. Um, the other way too, is that anytime you apply to a job, make sure you're, and we'll talk about this next week too, make sure you're going on and connecting with an engineer at that company. So especially if they're in your location. So if you apply to a, a front end engineer position at Google in San Diego, try to find an engineer on the front end team that works at Google in San Diego and connect with them. It's that you just have to hit a connection. So try to connect that way. Um, especially with people that would be in the companies that you want to work at. That's going to help you build your connections. Okay. Um, before I get into resume, are there any questions specifically on LinkedIn? Okay, cool. The resume is probably the most important presentation this round. Um, okay, so creating your resume like a boss. We are going to be helping you with your resume. So I know that right now this is going to seem like an overwhelming kind of presentation that you're getting. You're gonna get this slide. You can kind of work off of it like a checklist, but you're also gonna be working with your career coach. So just keep that in mind. We'll help you as much as we can. Um, this is just kind of to use as a guideline. So let's get started. In an ideal world, this is how you would write your resume um, and people would actually hire you. Unfortunately, you can't write your resume like this. Um, and, but we're gonna be here to help you especially your career coach, it's your resume is always going to be ongoing. It's not going to just, just going to be like a one and done kind of thing. You're always going to be adding to it, making changes. So keep that in mind. And this is going to just be a way to kind of help you start. This is your baseline. Okay. A couple of do nots for your resume. And these are important. Please do not write in comic sans or any unprofessional looking fonts, no curly letters, nothing like that. Even if you're a very creative, just kind of artistic person, it doesn't matter. Those, especially Comic Sans, is very frowned upon or any like crazy fonts where you can't read them. Please don't write, don't type in any fonts like that. Um, try to limit your resume to one page. For the most of you, you can do this. You can limit your resume to one page. There are going to be some situations where you just have a lot of experience and it might be two or three pages. We'll help you condense, try to get everything onto one page. So if you can try to keep it at one page, try to keep it there. Um, Never title your resume, resume.pdf. I, as a recruiter, probably am not even joking, got a thousand resumes a day titled resume.pdf. And so people, when people are like, hey, did you get my resume? I'm like, I mean, maybe, what's your name? Um, so you always want to title your resume with your, some form of your name in there. Um, never use anything crazy or unprofessional for your resume title. You want to title it either like first name. So it, like, for instance, my resume would be sbias.pdf. Um, or it can be your full name but you want some form of your name as your resume title so people can find it easily. Um, do not title it resume.pdf. Recruiters get a thousand resumes just like that and it's gonna be really difficult if they lose your resume. So make sure you're titling it with your name. Um, don't add fluff. So what I mean by fluff is you're not adding a bunch of like filler words and things like that. And we'll get to this a little bit later, but you're trying to really, your resume is to show off your technical skills and what you've done in your background. 
So for the most part, like even in your background, like it shows that you've been working, but you don't need to add a bunch of fluff about what you did day to day. If you were a store manager, all you need is your title. They can figure out what you did as a store manager and it's not super relevant anyway. So you don't need to have like a day to day checklist of what you did there as a store manager. And we'll get to that a little bit later too. So don't add fluff. Try to only talk about technical skills, things like that. Um, do not include your whole physical address. I know that I'm saying this right now and I'm going to look at a lot of your resumes and you're still going to have your physical, your whole physical address on there. Um, this is considered, and we've all done it. We all have the same resume format because we are all taught the same way to do a resume. Everyone has their whole physical address on there. You do not need that because as a recruiter, if they see that they're going to assume that like, okay, you're using an old school resume. You haven't written a resume in years. So all you need on your resume, if you're, if you're searching locally in your own city, so for instance, if you're searching in Austin, Texas, all you need is Austin, Texas. You don't need your zip code. You don't need your, your whole address on there at all. If you're going to be searching remotely or looking to relocate, don't put an address at all. Just leave it blank. Leave that whole portion blank. Um, and then if they ask you like, oh, hey, where are you? If you're trying to relocate to Austin and they're like, hey, you don't have an address on here. You can say, oh, I'm actually currently relocating to Austin and just keep it at that. But they don't need to know that you're in a different city or anything like that. So if you're looking to relocate, don't put an address. Um, but either way, you don't need your whole physical address, city and state. That's all you need. Um, do not add references. I know a lot of you have references right now attached to your resume or you like send it with your resume. Don't do this. This is also like an old school kind of thing to do. And that's also another red flag. So they'll ask for your references if they need your references. Otherwise, don't send it with your resume. Don't include it with your resume. Um, again, don't list things in your skill section that would be given. This can, is also considered fluff. Like, Excel, MS Word, like those are the kind of things that you should already know that are givens. You don't need to add that into your technical skills. Um, again, and then for technical skills, for skills in general, you only want to list technical skills. A lot of you are going to have soft skills as your skills. They don't need to know what your soft skills are. If you're going for a development job, they only need to know what your technical skills are. They'll figure out from the interview and by talking to you what your soft skills are. So you don't need to tell them like, I have great leadership skills. I have communication skills. Like, you don't need that. They'll figure that out. They'll figure that out anyways when they talk to you. So only technical skills in your skill section. Um, so for some dues, definitely put a good phone number on there. Good professional email. When I say professional email, I don't mean like anything crazy, like QD 457 or anything like that. It needs to be either like first name, last name, or a very professional looking email. It shouldn't be like, again, coding ninja at AOL.com. If you can, I would try to create a Gmail because Yahoo, AOL, Hotmail, those are all outdated and it's gonna, see, like, it's gonna make your resume seem outdated. Um, if that's the only email you have, that's okay, as long as the first portion of it is like just your name or like something professional. Um, please don't have an unprofessional email. It is very frowned upon. So, and trust me, we've had a lot of people have crazy emails. So yes, I do have to bring it up, but Make sure you have a good professional email. We're going to be checking your resumes. We'll let you know if we think it's professional or not. But if you can get a Gmail or if you have a Gmail, that's usually the first preference. Um, make sure you're being detailed about projects and Lambda School experience. So again, on your resume, they'll always do like a keyword search. Anytime you can talk about like the technical stack that you use, different development skills that you have, that's what you're trying to highlight on your resume. That's the kind of job you're trying to get. So be as detailed as possible about Lambda School and technical skills. Um, make it you add some of your personal sparkle. There's lots of ways to do this. Um, this kind of goes back to like making it a little bit more front end focused, things like that. But you can, you can add a picture. I've seen people add pictures. It's just going to be depending on what kind of job you're looking for, what kind of company you're looking for. But if you want to add a picture, you can, um, you can add like a little quirk in there. Your summary can make it very much like a unique type of resume. Your summary, your resume is not necessarily, I think people sometimes see your resume as something to stick out. While it should be a little bit unique to yourself, it's not necessarily a great thing to have like, I don't know, random quotes all over your resume or like something really quirky. Your resume, again, is really more for professional use. They're trying to see your skills. So while you can add some flair on there, just make sure it's appropriate. Um, on LinkedIn, you can be a little bit more quirky. Add some color. So it's okay if you have a black, white, and gray resume, as long as it's formatted and it looks nice. Myself, personally, I don't, I'm, I don't really have like a crazy colorful resume, but you don't want that typical black and white resume with no color, no formatting. And we'll get to that in a second. I'm sure probably half of you have that resume. I had that resume at one point. It's okay. We're going to fix it. Um, so try to add a little bit of color. 
add your degree type. So anytime you've got an, even if it's an associate's, associate's degree, bachelor's, master's, PhD, whatever, even if it's not in the technical realm, make sure you're adding your degree type. So not just your school and the date, degree as well. Um, so in an ideal world, this is how your resume would be structured. Some of you, for some of you, it's going to look a little bit different, especially if you use like a column based resume, but name and contact information somewhere at the top. Summary, which is optional. Not everyone's going to have a summary. Your projects and experience are the bulk of your resume. So your projects always need to be somewhere near the top as well as your experience, then your skills, then your education. Um, you want to do this because again, you're trying to get an engineering role. You're, you're, you need to highlight what you've done hands on. Your projects are what you've done hands on as a developer. That's what you've developed. So you want to talk about your projects um, and experience as well, kind of front and center on your resume. So looking at these two resumes, it's kind of easy to tell which one's traditional, which one's progressive. Keep in mind that depending on what type of company you're going for, that's what kind of resume you're going to have. So for some of you, you're going for more like startup, like kind of more progressive companies in general. It's okay to use a resume like this. For some of you who are going for like the IBMs, the Dells of the world, HPs, they do not want to see a progressive resume. Trust me, they do not. So you, and I tell people try to get something that's kind of in the middle. Like you want to find like a middle ground. So you're not having to customize your resume every time because you guys should not be customizing your resume for every job. I know that that at some point along the line, people have told you to do that. Please don't do that. Whatever's on your resume for your original resume, you shouldn't have to customize it at all because then that means that you're changing things to fit a job description and you shouldn't be doing that. You need to be telling them what you can and can't do. That's it. Um, so try to find a resume that's in the middle, but if you're going to be only leaning towards like startup progressive type jobs, get a progressive resume. If you're leaning only towards the HPs, the Dells, the IBMs of the world, stick to more traditional. So um, this kind of goes back to elevator pitch a little bit. If you are going to be using a summary on your resume, some of you will, some of you won't. Um, again, keep it fairly short. Do not use the I'm seeking a fun job or I'm seeking opportunities. Do not use that on your resume or your LinkedIn ever. They do not need to know that you're seeking a job. You're sending in a resume. They completely understand that you're seeking a job. Please don't put that as your summary. Um, and it doesn't explain anything. That's not past, present, or future at all. So a good summary would be something along the lines of this. So you're talking a little bit about your, your background, talking a little bit about what you want to do with your development skills. This would be a good summary. Or you can talk about, be a little bit more specific. Like I want it to be a developer because of this. So again, bad example. You never want to say anything about seeking a job or seeking employment. If I see that on your resume, I'm going to yell at you, just so you know, or your LinkedIn. Um, Try to do past, present, future, elevator pitch. Think of your elevator pitch. Um, or you can be really specific about what you want to do with your development skills. Your summary is specifically about you. It's very customizable. It should be unique. If you can answer, if you can use your summary for all kinds of things and it's like anyone could have that same summary, that means it's not a good summary. Make it unique to yourself. Um, and you can humble brag a little bit. Like this person talks about, you know, using their skills. This person talks about, how they had a sales career and it, it's, it's unconventional. So now they can do this and this and this. Humble brag y'all, it works, trust me. But again, your summary on your resume should be fairly short. It shouldn't be like a whole paragraph, maybe two or three sentences, maybe one or two sentences, honestly. Okay, so for projects. Projects are gonna be the highlight of your resume. Again, they should be the first thing that people see when they look at your resume. This is how you would set it up. So projects would be, you're writing your project name, a lot of people will actually link their project link to the project name. Most of you will do that. Some of you won't do that. Either way, it works as long as you have some, the link somewhere. Um, but some of you will link it to your project name. But when you're talking about your project, you want to talk about a, a little bit of blur about what it actually does. Like what is the function of your project? You want to talk about how it was created. So for a lot of you, you're going to be using your capstone project. It was a team project. So as a whole, you want to talk about how your team created the project, but if it is a team project, you also want to mention, I did the front end or I worked solely on this portion or whatever. You always want to talk about your individual contribution as well. Um, and then you want to list out your tech stack. The more detailed, the better. So function of your project, what it does, how you built it out. If it was a group project, you want to talk about your individual contribution and then you want to list your tech stack. Again, it's going to seem repetitive because you're listing this technology everywhere all over your resume. That's what you want to do. That's how we want to see it. Um, 
because when they do a keyword search, it's going to pop up everywhere. React will pop up all over your resume, and that's a good thing. Um, and then if you don't have, if you're not linking your project name to the actual link, you just put the link somewhere within the job description, the direct link. So some of you are not going to have a deployed link to a lot of your projects. That's okay. Um, we're going to be introducing HackHive. You can either use a HackHive portfolio like project link or your GitHub repo if you don't have a deployed link. Um, and then another thing I wanted to mention about projects, and we talked a little bit about this for LinkedIn, but I know right now a lot of you don't have a ton of big projects and that's okay. You're, you're probably going to be adding your capstone project eventually. Um, but in the meantime, I know you've done a lot of little projects with, with Lambda School. Or maybe you've done some that were self-taught. You are trying to put the projects on your resume on, and on your LinkedIn that you are excited about. So even if it was, has nothing to do with Lambda, even if it was a self-taught project, you did it in PHP. I don't know. But you love doing it and you're like, I, I really enjoyed doing this project. It's not complete yet, but I really loved it. It's not beautiful, but I loved it. Put that project on your resume. You are trying to, to put projects on your resume and your LinkedIn that you're really excited about, that you're proud of. You wanna do this because in an interview, it's gonna come across that way. You're gonna get excited when you're talking about it. And even if it's not complete, you can go and say, well, yeah, and I plan on adding you know, this component and this component, and, and you're gonna be excited about it. And it's gonna come across really well in your interview. So for instance, like the flip side of that is that, say, say for instance, you did your capstone project and you hated your capstone project. It's your most complete project. It's probably your biggest one. But if you hated doing it, why would you put it on your resume? Because when you're talking about it and you're like, yeah, it was fine, I guess. Like I did, you know, we worked on React. Like you're not gonna be excited about it and it's gonna show. Body language is everything. Being passionate about your projects, being passionate about what you're doing is everything in an interview, even in a technical interview. So. Trust me, even if your projects are not beautiful, even if they're not complete, if you enjoy doing it, those are the projects I wanna see on your resume. Okay, experience. So we kind of talked a little bit about, I, I love that, that blurb that we talked about for experience. You can use that in your LinkedIn and you can use that in your resume. Um, key things to talk about, for most of you, I'm actually gonna have you put Lambda School under experience rather than education, depending on what your resume and your background look like. So for most of you, you don't typically have a lot of experience to work with. So that's why I tell you to put Lambda School under experience instead, or you have like a big gap. Um, but if you were working in between Lambda and you have something to put there that fills in that gap, or if you have like no education and you wanna put something in education, you can put Lambda School in education. But for the most of you, I want you to put Lambda School in experience, especially if you were a PM or TA, um, you definitely wanna use Lambda School's experience if you were working there. So when I say experience, you're gonna see some of these templates that have employment, change that to experience. Because if you have Lambda School under employment, they're gonna assume that you work there and if you have to tell them that you didn't, it's gonna seem shady. So anytime you have any like professional experience or employment, change it just to experience and put Lambda School under there. Um, again, you don't wanna list yourself as a student, you're a full stack developer, full stack engineer, web developer, however you wanna say it, not student. Um, and then I kinda of sent you guys, you guys have that little blurb that I showed you on on LinkedIn, you can use that, but key things to remember, you wanna talk about the fact that it was a full-time program, six plus months full-time program. You learned CS fundamentals, algorithms, you learned the basics, basically. Um, you also wanna talk about the fact that you did pair programming, because in any job, you're gonna do pair programming. So you wanna mention that somewhere within your Lambda School experience. And then again, you, you wanna list out some of the curriculum that you learned. You don't have to list all of it out. Keep in mind, anything that you list here, they can ask you about. So again, if you hated Django, if you hated Python, don't put it in your curriculum. Like they'll ask you about it. So put things that you really enjoy doing, things that you would love to keep doing, things like that. Um, if you are a TA or plan on being a TA, um, this is how you would list out that experience. So a couple things to remember. You always want to list numerical values. How many students were you leading? Um, things like that. Uh, the other thing too is that they're going to call you PMs. We're trying to get them to change that because project managers in the outside world does not mean the same thing as what we call it at Lambda. Project managers, that title is gonna get you some really weird recruiter responses to that title. Um, don't ever list yourself as a project manager for Lambda School. You are a teaching assistant or a class lead, um, however you wanna say it, but project manager is not the same kind of title internally as it is externally for Lambda. Um, it's not a technical role really in, in the, the technical world. So list yourself as a TA or class lead. Um, you want to talk about how many students you work with, how many one-on-ones you led. The main thing to remember here is that you want to talk about doing pull request reviews because that's really cool that you guys get to do pull request reviews, STAs, 
you would be doing that as a lead developer for your team. So that's important for them to know that. Like you taught all of these people and you also did pull request reviews. So you want to make sure you mention that somewhere within your, your TA little description. If you are a TA or if you plan on becoming one. Um, so quantifying your accomplishments. Again, numerical values draw people's eye. That's just the way it is. Like anytime you can list a numerical value, a percentage, an increase, um, anything like that, that's what you're listing in your resume because it will draw some re a recruiter's eyes or your hiring manager's eyes. Um, so keep that in mind. That, that will help you eliminate a lot of the fluff for some of your other job descriptions too. So if you're like looking at it and you're like, you know, checked in every day or whatever, like you don't want day to day. You want like, I accomplished, I served 47 customers in one day, things like that. Like accomplishments, numerical values. Those are the key. Pro tip, have someone else write your resume for you. So you're already going to be meeting with Courtney and myself, whoever your career coach is. Um, we're going to be helping you essentially make your resume look beautiful. We're helping you kind of rewrite it, write it, things like that. So we're already one. Make sure you get other people's eyes on it. You're, so I will let you guys know, you're going to eventually be signing up for mock interviews, mock technical interviews with Brian in labs. He's going to ask you for a resume. You're, you're basically applying to like a fake job description. He's going to ask for your resume. So it would behoove you to either let him see it and give you feedback on it, let us see it so that he's not like, wow, your resume it looks terrible. Let us see it first. You have to meet with us anyway, so we're gonna see it. Um, but have other people look at your resume, share it with your peers, like, hey, let me see what yours looks like, whatever. It helps because people will give you feedback and some of it you will take, some of it you won't, but it'll help. And like sometimes we, we miss typos, we miss links that don't work, so have other people look at your resume. It's only gonna help you. Um, and also sign up for, to volunteer for mock tech interviews. It's gonna be scary, but it's so, so, so worth it in the end, just so you know. Okay, so when I was talking about that template that at some point all of us have had in our lives, this is the one I'm talking about. And this is the kind of resume that recruiters will get a thousand times a day from these outsourced third-party other staffing agencies because they'll, they'll rip people's information and put it on a template that looks just like this. And they'll get a thousand of these resumes. You do not want to be one of these resumes that they get. Again, you do not need your whole address on your resume. This is a black and white, boring resume. It's not, it's very much like a traditional format, kind of boring. They don't have, they have their skills and education up top. They shouldn't have that. Obviously this is not a developer, but at the same time, like this resume is terrible and it's boring and nobody would really want to read it. So don't have this resume. And if you do have it, it's okay. We're going to help you fix it. Here's another one. So one of my biggest pet peeves is when people don't have bullets. This reading a whole, no one wants to read a whole paragraph on a resume. Your resume literally is going to get a five second glance. And if they're looking at a, a paragraph, they're not even going to read it. And you're like, I don't know what that is. I'm not reading that. So again, this is not a developer. So this, maybe this is the kind of, I don't know, resume they have in, with lawyers or whatever, but this is not the kind of resume we're going to have as developers that you guys are going to have. So try to use bullets anywhere you can. If you ever have anything like under your descriptions, have a bullet or a couple bullets. Don't, don't do it in paragraph form. Um, and please don't, this is so condensed and so tiny for a lot of you. If you use credle, which we share later on, it's one of the template sites that we like credle will force you to have a one page resume. So even if you add a ton of information on there, it'll force you to have one page. If you're starting to see that it looks like this, you either need to add another page or you need to take some stuff out because it should never look this tight ever. Nobody wants to read that. That literally hurts my eyes and it's boring. That's what they'll be looking like if you have a resume like that. On the flip side, so you have your very traditional resume, which I just showed you. We want to avoid that. Even if you're going for progressive startup companies, you still have to have the right content on your resume. This is very much a progressive style resume. It's cool, whatever. It looks cool at first glance. This literally doesn't share anything. It doesn't talk about any of their projects, any of their background. You, you literally don't know what this person brings to the table, what they can and can't do. Also, so when can I start is extremely aggressive. You do not want to write that on your resume. It will be like not taken well. Um, but remember how I talked about rating your technical skills. You do not want to rate your technical skills. What if your rating is way lower than what they actually think? Then you're setting yourself up for a junior level position or you're setting yourself up for failure, honestly. Don't rate your skills. Just put your technical skills on there. Even if any of the templates that, that you're using are saying to rate your skills, take that portion off and you just put your skills. You list them all out. Um, the way that you want to technically 
like rate yourself without rating yourself um, so that people know like what you're stronger at, what you're not strong at. When you're listing your skills out, so even if you're listing it like column based, you want to list the things that you're strong at first. So like React, JavaScript, and then if you are not super strong at something, you can do Python Django at the bottom. So they'll read it as the top ones are what you're strong at, the bottom ones are what you're not strong at. Um, even if you list it in a line, same thing. You start off with React, whatever you're strong at in the front, and then towards the back of the line, what you're not strong at. So that's, you're already kind of, recruiters kind of know when you're rating yourself, when you're not. You don't need to physically rate yourself on any of your skills because you could be setting yourself, selling yourself short, honestly. Um, again, so very progressive resume, but the content here is not great. So you never ever want to say anything negative. Rule of thumb, another rule of thumb, in interviews and in resumes and LinkedIn, you do not want to be negative in any way. Having my, not my cup of tea, they don't care what you don't like to do. They do not care. They want to know what you can do, not what you don't like to do. So please don't put anything like that on your resume. Nothing negative. But this doesn't show off any of their any of their work, any of their projects, anything that they can actually do. So be wary of the content. Even if you're using one of these crazy progressive resumes, you can still do that, but make sure your content is there. Did I have a question? Oh, I heard someone get off mute. No? Okay, I'm keep going. Um, okay, this is one of my favorite resumes that I've seen come through. Um, this was a previous dev bootcamp person that we worked with a while back. So um, I like this resume because she has everything kind of laid out the way I want it to be. Um, this is, would be obviously considered a progressive type resume, but she has the right content. So she has her contact information, skills. Um, so this is what I'm saying. So like, for instance, CBC teaches Ruby. Her top skill is Ruby. And from as a recruiter, even though she doesn't list what her top skills are or anything like that, I can see that Ruby is her top skill. And obviously just starting with, well, you don't have to write just starting with Python. She has Python here at the end. I know that Python's not her strong suit. Ruby is. So you don't have to physically list out like, I'm good at this. I'm bad at this. You don't have to do that. The way you list it out is going to be important though. A um, couple things I would change on her resume. I would not have any of these soft skills. Content, well, some of these are not soft skills, but like communication, consumer behavior, you don't need those as your soft skills. You don't need any soft skills in your skill section, period. Um, but another thing that I wanted to mention, if any of you guys have, um, is that me? I'm getting some feedback, you guys. Everyone mute their, their Zoom thing. Okay. Um, if you can speak any other language aside from English, put it in there. It's important. Um, she obviously, Italian advanced, Russian native, English fluent. Um, if you can't, you don't need to list that you can speak English. It's literally if you're just if you're bilingual or trilingual, you want to make sure you write that. Some jobs require that. You never know. Um, I really like her resume, though, because of her layout. So she's got her statement, which is essentially her summary. She talks about past, present, future. Um, you don't have to have a summary again, but if you want one, it should be somewhere near the top. Uh, she has her projects listed first. She has a really cool section called community involvement. If you can fit this on your resume, if it, if it fits on your resume without pushing it to two pages, this would be a really cool section because you're going to have a community involvement piece because you have to have one for labs. So it would be a good, good place to put that. If you did a hackathon, if you've written a blog, like that would be a cool place to put, you know, something cool to put on your resume. Kind of helps you stick out from the crowd a little bit. Um, and then for her experience, the only thing I would change is obviously she lists student. You don't need to list student. She was no longer a student when she graduated. She was a web developer. But I love the layout of her, of her resume. And this is what I mean by a column type resume. For a lot of you, if you're having trouble fitting like on a block style resume, you're having trouble fitting it in one page, you can move over to column style and it'll organize it a little bit better for you. Um, I prefer column style resumes because I think they just look neater. Um, and it, it's way easier to organize your information without pushing it to two pages or making it look really tiny. But if you want to use a block style resume like this, you can, as long as you, again, have the same information and it's not super crunched. Um, hers actually doesn't look this tiny in real life. It's just the PDF doing that. But hers is, Krista's is really well done. She has good content. She has everything aligned with what I would say. So like summary, um, projects up front, then experience. She's got some certificates down here because she, so here's another thing. If you guys are seeing, because sometimes there's a flip side and if you don't have a lot of information or a lot of anything to put on your resume, you're going to have a lot of white space. You don't want a lot of white space either. You don't want it to look crunched, but you also don't want to have like big blocks of white space. So 
You can fill that in by like volunteer work or certificates that you have, things like that. Um, and then these are just some, so Canva, Visual CV, Credle, and Cake Resume, these are resume template sites. You do not have to use these by any means. These are just some sites to help you get started. Use whatever you like to use. Um, I'm not gonna make you, I'm not making anything mandatory as far as templates go. I use Google templates, Google resume templates, like they work just as well. Um, Microsoft templates, they work just as well. Use a, a template that's gonna work well for you. Um, and then we're gonna go through it with you guys. Like we'll help you kind of organize things the way it should be, um, but make it your own. Use whatever resume, you, whatever template you wanna use really. Um, just remember the key things, add some color in it, make sure it's formatted the way we said, kind of organized the way we said. Um, but you're gonna be meeting with us anyway, so we'll be able to help you with that. This is kind of really just a baseline to get started. Cool, before we finish up with this call, I'm gonna ask, I'll let you guys ask questions as well, um, and I'll open my Slack back up so we can check it out. But I wanted to introduce HackHive. So some of you, some of the alums that are here know what HackHive is. HackHive is, when I was telling you guys that a lot of you are not gonna have deployed links, HackHive is where that comes in. So I hate GitHub, and I'm gonna give you a secret, most technical recruiters, because we're not really technical, hate GitHub. So if you send me to a GitHub page, all I can see is like your little green graph or like lines of code. I don't know what that is. I'm not gonna know what that is. I can't see your project from there. I would not know how to navigate to your project. That's where HackHive comes in. Especially for people who like don't wanna take the time to make their whole portfolio or whatever. HackHive is literally a portfolio website. I have a sign up code. I actually work with Varun, he's a creator. Um, he is really good about, he's, he, this is very much a startup. And so we were working with him to have people create hack hives. A lot of our students have like found some bugs or they have feedback for him and he implements it like right away. He's really good with working people with people to like make it a good portfolio site that developers want to use. So it's at very much like early stages. So you have all the input that you can give him. Like he wants your input. He wants to hear your feedback, what you think about it. But I really like HackHive because you can have a projects page and you can put all your projects here. Like for instance, um, it's not just showing your code either. It's actually showing, um, this is what it looks like, the different pages. But if you create a project page, you can do little um, screenshots of your project. You list out what you built it with. Um, you still have like all of your information on here. So you can put your LinkedIn on here, your GitHub. So it's kind of like a portfolio page where you can share your projects. But like the actual visual representation of your projects, which is really what, recruiters want to see like they want to see what it looks like they want to see what it does and what it looks like um, and then there's all these different kind of things so like you can have an overview of your projects the features that you have people can give you feedback <laughs> you guys mute your things please um, and you can have all kinds of stuff and you can put as many projects on here as you want and then there's also really cool like whole career section on HackHive because they're going to be trying to use this as a portfolio sharing tool so they're sharing it with like hiring partners things where you like kind of talk about um, your status, like if you're currently looking, you can put your resume on here, your preferred positions, location, what you prefer to focus in. So it's like a whole like career section as part of HackHive. Um, and they're building that section out. So it's really cool. I will send you the link to sign up with HackHive. We have our own Lambda invite link. So please don't just go on and apply yourself. I will send you a link for Lambda if you're gonna use it. Um, but check out some of the other students that have joined so far. I love it. I think it's a really cool tool. Um, a lot of people have given me really good feedback on it. So. Check it out if you want to start building your portfolio. I think it'd be really cool. Um, and I'll send that guys, I'll send that over to you guys. Don't let your dreams be dreams, meaning I know this was really overwhelming and a lot of information, but we're gonna help you. You're gonna have the best resume you could possibly have by the end of this run after labs. So cool. I'm going to stop sharing and get on Slack so that I can see some of your questions. But if anyone has questions now, please feel free to ask. Oh my gosh, I have a 57 chat messages. <laughs> okay, go ahead, you guys, shoot with questions. I'm ready. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I am I am from uh, from Poland, so Polish is my my native language, and English is second. Uh, do you think I should make LinkedIn profile mainly in English or Polish? I know that it may cater to more local area, but I am more interested in working in English English environment with more people. Um, I would suggest, because English is more of a well-known language, just in general, all over the world, 
to have your LinkedIn profile in English. Just, you don't want to, because if you have it in your local language, you're only going to get calls back on, on local positions. Um, so if you're interested in working with like more of an English speaking language type company, I would have your, your LinkedIn profile and your resume in English. LinkedIn lets you do both. Or you can do both. I mean, definitely English first, because that's like the business language of the world, but LinkedIn lets you have two. Yeah. Just be careful with that, though, because sometimes, I, for some reason, and I've seen people do this where they have both, it'll only show up the, like, the more of like the, the other language and not the English language. So just be careful with that, too. Um, but you can do both. Um, but I would definitely have one, at least in English, uh, just so you can open up your, your job search a little bit. It'll just broaden your job search. Okay, let me see. I want to make sure I'm not missing any questions in Slack. I have a question about like representing experience or representing Lambda like as experience rather than education. If we put that under like, I mean, setting aside any sort of like experience as a PM or a TA, isn't representing that as professional experience kind of misleading? Like aren't employers going to think that we're lying? So remember how I said, if it says professional experience, just change it to experience. So professional experience and employment imply that you were employed at that actual position. I think experience, like, I mean, calling ourselves a project or a, a, a software engineer or whatever kind of implies professional experience too, doesn't it? Like, we're so, not to software me, engineers, we're students. If you have, ex well, but when you graduate, you're no longer a student. Well, you know, yeah, that's experience. correct, but that's why it's like past experience. It's not current experience anymore once we're not at Lambda, right? I would always keep it as experience because especially because it was such a long program like you guys you literally like it's almost a seven month program and it's almost like you went through a full semester or something like a full it's like a full-time job so that's why we have you keep it under experience you're not it's not saying employment you're not saying professional experience you're not saying employment you're just saying experience so if someone asks you about it and they're like kind of implied professional experience though like but that's the reason there's experience and education there's two separate sections no the implication is intentional and you should just lean into it, honestly. Yeah, and if they ask you, because it is experience, if it, even if they're asking about it and they're like, well, I, I see that you, you have it listed under experience, but you didn't actually work there, you can say, no, I have it listed under experience because it was a six month, seven month full time experience. It's more like an apprenticeship program. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or again, higher education, apprenticeship, academy, however you want to say it, it's part of your experience. And the reason that we're telling you to put it under experience is because if you don't, you're either going to have this really giant seven month gap in your experience, or they're going to assume that like, this is just another portion of like one of those self-taught programs. It's harder to explain when you put uh, Lambda school in education, what it actually is. Like you don't have a lot of space in your education section most of the time. And you can't list out like all the things that we just talked about in your education tab. That's why you put it under experience. And even if they're, they're thinking that you're implying that, you can just say, well, I didn't say it was employment. I said it was experience because it was. I was here for seven months. It was, we coded 40 hours a week plus. It was basically a full-time job. And at the very end of it, we created this really cool capstone project that is very functional. We, it was, we worked on a hands-on team in an agile development environment, and we created a functional app or functional project. So that's how you would get around saying that. Um, and even if it does imply that, and you know what? You're right. We are trying to imply that this was like kind of a, a working thing. You, it was basically a full-time job and you want people to know that. Like it wasn't just like this, some part-time program that you did to like, whatever. It's not a boot camp. It's a full-time experience. Um, but yeah, that's kind of why we have you list that. And, and it's okay if they ask, they will ask you about it. If they really are questioning it, they'll ask you about it. And that's how you answer that question. I'm trying to scroll down through Slack, but does anybody have any questions other than what they wrote in Slack? <laughs> I don't see any questions. I just see you guys kind of just. Uh, so gaps are red flags. What if you have a, ma a major gap? Like I have one for about three, four years, uh, but it's because of health issues. I had cancer. So I, I know being in an interview, you don't want to be like, yeah, I had cancer. So I mean, what? what what kind of thing can we do for something like that? So honestly, I would actually have on there like medical leave for you just have medical leave as like the basically like basically a company name, like where you'd have a company name. And then from the time that you finished, like the whole duration of that time, 
and then they will ask you about that. So here's the thing. If you have it on your resume, they most likely won't ask you about that because they shouldn't. They're not really allowed to ask you. But in the situation that they do, you flat out tell them. It's okay. And I know it's, I said, like, try to avoid saying anything negative, but that's not, that's something that actually happened. And it's, it's actually like, listen, I, I was sick and I did this program and I'm ready to work. I mean, that's actually a huge accomplishment. And I think that most of the interviewers would take it that way. And if they don't, then maybe you don't really want to work there because they suck. <laughs> um, How far should we go back though on the resumes? A uh, good question. So on your resume, depending on what your, your situation is. So for most of you, some of you actually will have like degrees on there and say you graduated and like, if you have an actual graduation date, so if you graduated 2012, you start your resume from 2012 up. If you don't have a graduation date, you can start wherever you want to start. I would say if you don't have a graduation date, but you have like at least 10 years of experience, you want to start 10 years back, but you never want to go past like basically 2000. Like if you have experience from like 1992 to 2000, leave that off. You want to start with 2000. But if you have a graduation date, so for instance, if you graduated 2013, start your resume from 2013. Um, that's why it's, it's completely up to you where you want to start your resume. Some people have a degrees and they just don't want to have their graduation date. Then you can start your resume wherever you want to start it. You can start it with just Lambda School. I don't suggest that, but you can do that if you want to. What about gaps that aren't you know, just, they're just life gaps, not like, you know, like they can't really bug you about medical leave or whatever, but what about just gaps that are because, you know, so it, I, know I, mean, I took some time off work. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. So here's the thing with gaps. If it's a six month less and six month and less gap, you don't have to explain it. But if it's six months and more, you want to have something you, you have to have an explanation for your gap because either way, if you have more than six months or like to a year or longer than that, they're going to ask you about it. And you'd rather just flat out say it on your resume rather than having a whole interview around your gaps. Cause you don't want that either. You, you want to interview for your job. You don't want to just be talking about your gaps. So in that situation, you can say like sabbatical, you can say time to travel. You can say whatever you want to say, but if it's a year, if it's six months, plus of a gap, you need to explain it on your resume. So sabbatical sounds good. hundred percent. Like that sabbatical. sounds a lot better than like, well, I didn't work because I had too many kids or whatever. There you go. Or you can say full-time mom, full-time dad. However, you can say whatever you want to, to explain your gap. As long as you explain it, if it's more than six plus months, does that make sense? If it's, if it's less than six months, you don't, don't worry about explaining it. But if it's more than six months, then you need to have a line explaining it. And it's okay. Like they're adults. Like they understand that they're, you know, sometimes people don't work. They're doing other things. So as long as you explain it up front, you're just, you just don't want them to just be asking you about literally your gaps the whole time. Cause they will, because recruiters are trained to ask you if you have a gap that's six plus months long, they have to ask you about it. Like that's what they're trained to do. And you don't want to spend a whole interview conversation around that. You want to interview for real. Like you were, talking about your skills, you're talking about what you can bring to the team, what they can bring to you as employers. That's what you want to talk about in your interview. So as long as you're explaining those, those bigger gaps, that's, and it's okay. It's okay. Whatever you put on there. And we'll, and like I said, Courtney and I are going to be working with you guys, looking over your resume with you. We'll help you come up with the best solution for some of these, these issues too. But sabbatical is always a good one. Kind of like encompasses everything. Um, any other questions? Um, I want to get back to the putting it under experience thing real quick from Ellen. So again, at the end of the day, your resume is your own. I'm not advising you to lie. It's part of your experience. Like I'm not telling you straight up, say that you're employed. That's why I said, don't put, a, don't have employment as your subject. I would put it under experience because you spent almost seven months here. And that would be a gap that if you take that out of experience, you're going to have a gap unless you were working in between that time, then you don't need to put it under experience. But for most of you, you were doing this full time. There was no time to work in between. So you have to fill in that gap. A B it is part of your experience. Like you're not saying I was employed with Lambda. And if you were a TA, then you were employed with Lambda. You're getting paid. You're getting a paycheck. You, you're employed with Lambda. So if you were a TA, you're hundred percent, you were employed. Even if you weren't though, you're not listing it under employment, you're listing it under experience. So if, even if they, in their mind, your interviewer is like, well, you didn't work there. You don't have to say I worked there. 
he said, I, well, it's part of, I was doing this for six months full time. So it was part of my experience. But at the end of the day, it is your resume. I will not make anything mandatory. You do not have to mandatory put anything on your resume. It's yours. You're going to have to speak to your own resume in interviews. So if you don't feel comfortable putting it, things in certain places, then don't. These are just suggestions. I was a technical recruiter for a long time. These are the things that I was told, you know, trained to look for. These are things that caught my eye, different things like that. So at the end of the day, if you don't want to put under experience, you don't have to. Nothing is mandatory when it comes to your resume. It's your resume. And I don't want you to feel uncomfortable talking about certain things on your resume. That's like the opposite of what I want you to do. I want you to feel comfortable with everything that's on your resume. Cool. Let's see. Just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Did I miss anything? Any questions on Slack? I don't think so. Um, I will answer to some of y'all's comments on Slack, but it doesn't look like I missed any big questions, I don't think. Oh, if I did, I'm yes. Sorry. <laughs> um, mine's kind of more of about um, dressing for an interview. And I've been trained uh, to basically, I guess, somewhat overdress to a degree, but also coming from an industry where my background's kind of a mixture of real estate and mobile gaming. So both of those genres are a little different, whereas uh, commercial real estate was more formal, mobile gaming's more casual. And this sort of environment, would you say it depends on the company you're applying to, or should we just play the safe bet and plan to dress professionally versus like more casually? Great question. Um, so in two weeks, you guys have your big interview and slash offer negotiation presentation. It's my favorite presentation that I give throughout all of careers. And we're going to talk super like about interviews, but I'm, or just kind of ahead of time, rule of thumb for interviews. You dress a level up of however they dress every day in the company. So if a company is, is casual and they literally... Here's my thing, you guys, you should always ask your recruiters, no matter what, I don't care what they tell you, ask your recruiters how you should dress. Say, okay, what's the attire for this interview if you're going on site? It's okay if you ask that. They expect you to ask that. Don't feel weird about asking that question. If they're like, oh no, it's, it's casual, like we just wear jeans, whatever. We wear shorts and flip-flops, but it's super casual. You dress a step above whatever they dress like every day. So if it's casual, then you want to wear business casual, meaning men, slacks, and a polo. Um, women may be like, a nice dress, I don't know, or slacks in a polo if you want to, but business casual. So you always want to do a step up. If they're business casual, then you want to dress business professional. That means suits, that means slack, nice slacks, nice dresses, things like that. So rule of thumb is always a, a step above what they normally wear at the office. And most of the time interviewers, it's kind of like a test, honestly, if you ask them, they're like, oh no, we wear jeans, like just wear jeans, whatever. So don't wear jeans, they're testing you. Wear a step above. So just dress nice. It does, you don't have to wear a suit. If it's casual environment, you also don't want to overdress. So you have to be wary of that too. Um, so rule of thumb is just one step above what they normally wear. And we're going to, we have like literally the interview presentation is very in depth and you're, we're going to be covering that throughout the, like this whole length of time plus labs. So we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Any other questions that I can answer? Resume, LinkedIn, elevator pitch. Nope. We'll get one-on-ones with you guys too, right? Yeah. So like if I have yes. questions that are only useful to me and would waste everybody else's time, I can do that in my one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, cool. Like I have specific <laughs> things I didn't want to make everybody else listen to. <laughs> um, don't worry about it. But yes, um, so kind of to round this out because I want to give you guys some time to kind of look at these slides um, and gather your thoughts. I know that was a long present, longer than it usually is. Um, but just so you guys know, don't feel bad about us. We 100% want you guys to ask questions. You should have seen some of our earlier classes where nobody would ask. And we only had like seven students in some of our earlier classes, you guys. So these presentations are just going to get longer and longer with questions. We want to hear from you. We want to know what you're thinking. So don't feel bad about asking questions. I, that's what we're here for. We're here to answer them. So just so y'all know, yes, you're going to get individual one-on-ones. Um, I'm going to send out a list. So Courtney and I basically split you guys up. Um, Half of you will go with me, half of you will go with Courtney. Courtney is out until next week, but you shouldn't be scheduling any one-on-ones until next week either. So finish out this week, and then starting next week on the 6th, those, I think it's the 6th through the 10th, is when you should be scheduling your one-on-ones. Um, these are going to be longer one-on-ones, 60-minute one-on-ones. It's an hour for with working with us. And basically, we're going to do go over everything from your resume to your LinkedIn to your background, get to know you guys a little bit. So 100% you're getting one-on-ones with us. Um, I'm about to share the list on Slack. 
but thank you for asking a bunch of questions. I appreciate it. I love it. Um, let me stop recording. So